All right. Um, let's get started. Thank you again for joining us. Um, sorry for the brief delay. My name is Alana Stidey, and I'm the Research and Organizing Manager at the Department for Professional Employees, or DPE. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Katie Barrows, Communications Director at DPE, and we're, we're both based in Washington, D.C., um, you'll notice you're in a webinar, so we have a Q&A function that um, if you choose to ask a question, we'll have a Q&A period near the end of um, this program. Just make sure that if you would like to remain anonymous when you ask your question, just click that um, anonymous button before you ask your question. Um, we also have Bonnie Brusky here, an organizer at the Office of Professional Employees International Union, or OPEIU, and David Balsevich, a member of OPEIU Local 9, who works at the insurance company Northwestern Mutual, and they both join us from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So DPE is a trade organization of the AFL-CIO, which is a large umbrella organization uniting scores of labor unions. Um, at DPE, we work with 24 unions that represent professionals across the workforce. That means that we work with unions that represent people in a variety of professions, from healthcare and education to engineering, legal services, the performing arts, administrative services, and many other fields. Um, more specifically, we assist unions with research about professionals in the workforce, and we conduct legislative advocacy around issues that matter to professionals and the unions that represent them. Um, we host programs and outreach services for the unions that we work with, um, but we also host public events like this one geared towards specific audiences. Um, and then we also work on communications and organizing resources for our affiliate unions. Um, the Office and Professional Employees International Union, or OPEIU, is one of DPE's affiliate unions. Um, OPEIU is a union of more than 103,000 employees in technology, credit unions, hospitals, insurance agencies, colleges and universities, hotels, administrative offices, and more. Um, OPEIU has members in every state as well as in Canada. Um, Insurance Professionals United, it's the logo that you see on the left, is an initiative of OPEIU that brings together insurance professionals who are members of the union. So DPE is working with Insurance Professionals United to help promote the benefits of insurance um, professionals joining together to form a union at their workplace. Um, OPEIU members who are part of Insurance Professionals United have used their collective power to create fairer workplaces and have secured higher pay, better benefits, and improved working conditions. Their aim is to help insurance professionals across the country gain a voice in their workplaces and raise standards throughout the industry. Um, so here's a quick agenda for tonight's program. First, I'll share the results of an online survey about the working conditions of insurance professionals. Um, perhaps some of you even took that survey, and if you did, we appreciate your contribution. Next, my colleague Katie will discuss the basics of forming a union. Then Katie will leave a dis lead a discussion with union member and insurance professional David Balsevich about his experiences as a union member. And lastly, we'll have some time for a Q&A from the audience. Um, before we provide an overview of the survey results, we wanted to take a quick poll. So let me launch that poll for you and we will ask that question. We're looking for a little interactivity here. So the question is, have you ever talked to a coworker about wanting to improve working conditions? This is a yes or no answer. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds, but thank you so much um, everyone for participating.
I see that someone has raised their hand. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, we can unmute you. Um, I think just know that you won't be anonymous. Is that right, Katie? When when the attendee asks a question? For, uh, correct. But it looks like they lowered their hand. Okay. So never mind. <laughs> um, I'll end that poll. And it looks like um, everyone. Oh, forgive me. I'm sharing. Everyone can see the poll now. Um, it looks like 100% of you all have indeed talked to your coworker about wanting to improve working conditions. So um, that's great to hear. You're in the right place. And we hope to provide more information um, for you about um, how to go about doing that next steps and learning more about um, being a union member. Okay, now moving on to the survey, here's an overview of the Insurance Professionals Working Condition Survey. Um, this was a non-scientific online survey that was self-selecting, so we need to caution against extrapolating these results to draw conclusions about the broader population of insurance professionals. Um, even so, the results were striking, so we're looking forward to sharing them with you. Um, we received 64 responses and the survey was fielded online from February to September of this year. Before we dive into the results, though, I wanted to share a few demographic points about who the insurance professionals were who were surveyed. Um, the chart on the left uh, shows that the majority of respondents were women at about 56%. Um, and about 41% were men. The remaining 3.2% either identified as gender nonconforming or they chose not to specify. Um, on the right, we see that the age distribution of the respondents skewed slightly younger, but not by much. Most were between the ages of 25 and 49. Here we have the breakdown of racial identities of the respondents. About 69% identified as white, about 14% identified as Hispanic or Latino, and that's of any race. 11% um, identified as Black or African American. 3% um, identified as multiracial or another race. 3% identified as Asian. 3%, um, oh, forgive me, sorry. I, <laughs> misread that, um, and a little over 1% identified as um, American Indian or Alaska Native. Um, again, I just want to caution that um, these results may not be representative of the broader population of insurance professionals, but um, a fair amount of these numbers did map on pretty, pretty nicely to um, national statistics. So we asked what type of insurance company respondents work at, and we learned that respondents were most likely to work at a company that provides auto insurance, property and casualty insurance, and or home insurance. 59% um, of the 64 respondents voluntarily indicated where they work, and we learned that the survey respondents work at a variety of insurance companies. So more than 35 companies were mentioned, ranging from small insurance companies to large corporations. Um, this tells us that across the insurance industry, professionals are eager for workplace improvements. It's important to know that there were a variety of responses because it's a reminder that like you're not alone here. The issues that you are faced with at work are experienced by your peers across the insurance industry too. Um, the most effective way to make um, workplace improvement is by joining together in union. Um, of course, so we were curious to know what level of support existed among respondents for a proposal to have a union in their workplace. About 74% of respondents would approve, more than half of whom indicated strong approval as opposed to just moderate approval. Additionally, we asked in what area of insurance the respondents currently work. 
the majority of respondents work in claims, call center, customer service, sales, and or marketing. And most of the respondents work at insurance companies that employ over 2,000 people. We also wanted to get a sense of how many hours respondents worked in a typical week. Um, most respondents work between 40 and 49 hours in a typical week, which is great to hear. Um, but 11% work uh, 60 hours or more per week. So part of what's great about forming a union at your workplace is gaining a say in workplace decisions, including the ability to formally address desired improvements. So for these respondents, pay is the number one desired improvement, um, which is not totally surprising considering pay is the number one desired improvement across the board for working people in this country. Um, but the next most desired improvement um, was hours or work-life balance followed by opportunities for promotion um, and then health insurance benefits. Um, to give you a sense of some of the other workplace improvements um, options that we asked that respondents could have selected, um, we have paid time off, communication, work from home policies, transparency, equal treatment, having a say in work decisions, professional development opportunities, retirement benefits, diversity, equity, and inclusion, health and safety, parental leave, and an other category. Um, there was also an option to select, I don't want to see any changes in my workplace. So the vast majority of respondents though, want some sort of change for the better at their job. Um, joining together with your coworkers to form a union is a great way to improve your workplace. Um, in conversations with insurance professionals, we have heard that standards have been eroding at insurance companies. So we wanted to ask our survey respondents whether they felt that standards have in fact been er eroding um, over the past like five to 10 years. Over 50% of respondents said yes, they did feel that standards have eroded. We also asked about job satisfaction, and we learned that about 44% of the insurance professionals surveyed are unsatisfied with their jobs. A quarter of those surveyed are very unsatisfied, um, which isn't great to hear. Um, but I do want to pause and take another minute to do another poll. Um, and surprise, surprise, um, I would like to ask you all. How satisfied are you with your job? Note that you can select very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, neither satisfied nor satis unsatisfied, somewhat unsatisfied, or very unsatisfied. So I'll give you a few more seconds to complete that poll. We still have a couple of responses trickling in, so I'll end the poll in a few more seconds. Okay, I will share the results and we will see. Um, how satisfied are you with your job? We have 7% that said they're very satisfied, which is great. 14% said somewhat satisfied, 4% said neither satisfied nor unsatisfied, 39% said somewhat unsatisfied, and 36% of you said very unsatisfied. Um, so hold that with you for the time being. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the insurance industry um, and how joining together in union um, could help remedy some of those feelings of dissatisfaction. So bringing it back to union approval, we know that an overwhelming number of respondents, 74% would support a proposal to form a union at their workplace. So how do we go about forming one? Now I'll turn it over to Katie for an overview of the steps that it takes to form a union. Thanks, Alana. Um, 
and to form a union in the private sector, and uh, which includes anyone who works for a business, a nonprofit or organization, or any other non-governmental entity, you must be a W-2 employee. And you cannot be a supervisor, confidential, or managerial employee. Effectively, this means that as long as you do not have the power to hire or fire other employees, do not work in HR, and are not an independent contractor, you are able to form a union under U.S. labor law. With that said, most employees are um, most employees are eligible to form a union. In fact, over six million professionals, including doctors, lawyers, scientists, um, and insurance professionals, are already union members. Uh, with regard to the union organizing process, the first step is connecting with a professional union organizer who can guide you through each part of the process of forming a union. So if you reach out to us, um, DPE, uh, at organize at dpe.org, we will work with you to connect you with an organizer um, and we'll connect you with OPEIU. Next, uh, you will build support in your workplace uh, working with an organizer, and you will um, have conversations uh, with your coworkers. Um, so a, a union organizer will help you uh, by identifying who is union by working with you to identify who is union eligible in your workplace, and then you will begin having conversations with these coworkers about forming a union. As you have these initial conversations, you will identify strong union supporters. Um, and you will join together with these coworkers to build more union support. When you have organizing conversations with your coworkers, you will want to make sure you are not using work devices or your work email address or phone number, and that you are not discussing forming a union on work time. Uh, you'll want to make sure you're using personal devices and talking to your coworkers before work, after work, at lunch, or on a break. Additionally, you'll want to be cautious about who you talk to about your union organizing campaign. Specifically, you do not want to discuss the campaign with managers because the decision to form a union is yours and your coworkers alone. Next, uh, when you have support uh, for your union from a strong majority of your coworkers, you will have these supporters and yourself sign union authorization cards. A union authorization card is a document or card that states you want to be in a union in your workplace. It's a good idea to have a super majority of your coworkers sign cards so that you'll have a strong showing of support when the time comes for a, an election for union representation. Generally, a union is certified through a union election or voluntary recognition. Uh, voluntary recognition occurs when the organized employees ask their employer to recognize their union based on their signed authorization cards. Some employers do this. However, many uh, groups of organized employees go straight to the National Labor Relations Board or the NLRB and file for a union election. Once the election petition is filed, the employer is notified that their employees want a union. Legal protections kick in that prevent the employer from retaliating and the union employer work with the NLRB to schedule the election. A majority, 50% plus one of the, of the employees who vote in the union election must vote for the union for the union to win and be certified. After your union is certified, you will collaborate with your employer to schedule sessions to negotiate your first union contract. Management is legally required to negotiate with your union on pay, benefits, and working conditions. Negotiations generally take multiple, multiple sessions and um and compromise between union members and management to reach a tentative agreement on the contract. Lastly, once the tentative agreement is reached, the full union membership will vote on whether to ratify the contract. If a majority of your coworkers agree to ratify the contract, then it's finalized and applied to your workplace. The process of negotiating a union contract is known as collective bargaining. And collective bargaining for a first contract can take over a year to complete. And again, if you're interested in being connected with a union organizer to start start this process, uh, you should email us at organize at dpeflcio.org. Um, and there's before I uh, transition to our uh, discussion with David, um, 
who, as we mentioned, is a union member and insurance professional. We want to emphasize that your right to unionize is federally protected. Under the National Labor Relations Act, you have the right to organize or join a union or participate in collective efforts to improve your workplace without interference or influence from your employer. Your employer cannot discriminate against you for being in the union. Uh, and the slide that we're sharing right now um, contains information from the NLRB or the National Labor Relations Board's website about your right to join uh, together in union with your coworkers. So uh, now um, I'll turn to a discussion, to have a discussion with David uh, about what it's like to have um, a union in an insurance workplace. So I will spotlight David and myself. So um, welcome, David. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, including your role at Northwestern Mutual um, and how you became a member of uh, OPEIU? Yeah, absolutely. So I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I uh, work at Northwestern Mutual. I've been there for about two and a half years. Um, Northwestern Mutual is a pretty large uh, financial planning insurance and investment company. They do have a wide variety of different products such as uh, life insurance, disability, long-term care, et cetera. Um, I there am an expert client service representative. So I actually take phone calls from uh, some of our field members and help them with the application process and the underwriting process. Um, so it's a lot of back-end work. And then as far as um, how I became with the union or to join the union. Um, you know, with my history, I've, I have a history of multiple jobs throughout different industries. And, you know, I've always saw the union as a strong backup, like a, a, just a strong, you know, person to have your back. And when I start seeing changes that I think could go in a certain direction, you know, that's when I want to rely on them. So that's what got me to join is just in case I want to have somebody who has my back. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. And, um, you know, uh, that's a lot of a lot of professionals uh, throughout different industries. That's why they they join their union is they, you know, they really appreciate someone having their back in the workplace. Um, I guess going back to uh, you know, working in the insurance industry in general, um, what do you enjoy most about, uh, working in the insurance industry? Um, so insurance is there for you when you need it, just like the union. Um, I found that I personally have a calling for service. So it's one thing I really like, uh, with what I do, knowing that every day and every call I take is making a difference in people's lives, uh, whether it's people I'm talking to directly on the phone, um, or the people, you know, in their lives that it's impacting on their end. Um, and, you know, what do you, what do you value about being an OPIU member? Um, like I said, definitely having, you know, people and a group of people that have my back. Um, you know, I have stewards I can go to. I have, you know, the main office for the union I can go to for questions. Um, you know, I, I feel more comfortable, more protected, more confident. Um, I don't have to feel like, uh, you know, if my job is at risk at any time. Um, definitely gives me a stronger sense of security and protection. And then also, you know, just knowing that I have a voice in the process. Yeah, and, and more specifically, what are some of the uh, benefits that you and your coworkers um, have as as uh, union members that non-union employees often, uh, you know, do not have. Yeah. So, and like I said, I've have, you know, a wide variety of work experience and being non-union and union seeing that there's definitely a lot more benefits when it comes to you know, working with a union. Um, for example, with us, we have um, caregiver leave, which allows us some time to take time off uh, work to go take care of a loved one. Um, a significant amount of PTO, um, employer contributions to employee pensions, retirements, 401k. Um, also being able to vote on the new uh, new union contracts and having a voice to request those changes. Um, I will say we are currently 
opening up uh, negotiations for a new contract. And it definitely is really nice to be able to voice any con uh, concerns or changes or requests that I have to, you know, multiple people within the union who are going to take that to the negotiations as well. Um, and then also having the wine garden rights, um, which wine garden rights are the re uh, right to request representation during, um, you know, meetings that you may may not know how it's going to go. And we're uh, uh, sh share. Are we going to we're going to share the just like screen on wine garden rights really quickly? Uh, so this, uh, if you want to learn more about wine garden rights, uh, the NLRB website, nlrb.gov, um, you know, goes in the further detail. Um, but here's a screenshot of the webpage and, and um, you know, a brief summary of wine garden rights. And then, um, David, what advice would you give an insurance professional who's considering forming a union? Um, and, and uh, is interested in learning more about forming in their workplace. Yeah, so advice I could really give is, I mean, looking at the last couple of years that we've had, you know, COVID changed the insurance industry, you know, probably globally. Um, you know, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And there are some things that are just growing too quickly. And, you know, if it isn't regulated, people and employees, you know, can get burnt out. Unions, you know, definitely can help um, you know, companies grow and, you know, stay stable. Um, and we, we do have like a, a question in the chat for you. Um, and, uh, they're asking about how difficult was it for you to set up your union? Um, I, I just want to make it, uh, that David, your union has been at, um, your organization for a while. So, um, you all didn't, organize this brand new unit, but you, uh, you joined and, uh, signed a card, uh, or uh, yeah, signed a card in to, to join OP, uh, to join the OPIU local. Um, but do you notice any, uh, differences in people's, um, like health or mood that, because you have like a voice and a union in your workplace? Yeah. Um, like I said, yeah, the union was already established when I started working there. Um, I definitely see, you know, more voicing of opinions and concerns when it comes to, you know, the workplace in general. Um, a lot of things change and you just don't know what's going on. And just being able to be confident and have somebody to go to to help voice that concern, you know, is really comforting. Awesome. So now, um, thank you, David. Uh, is if we're going to turn it over to uh, audience questions. So um, I'm going to also add Bonnie and Alana to our spotlight uh, so that they can chime in if uh, the question uh, presents that like uh, is, is asked to them or or if they want to chime in. But um, so if folks have a question, please either put it in the Q&A or um, or uh, raise your hand. Um, so one one of the things um, we do have a question about uh, wine garden rights and um, just to to reiterate what David said is that uh, you know if you have a union in your workplace, you have the right to request representation uh, during an investigatory interview, or um, generally that's a meeting where you could be disciplined um, in any way. And um, so then it's kind of like Miranda rights uh, and, you know, when you get stopped by a, a police officer, but um, so you can uh, request to have a union representative uh, in that meeting with you who, uh, you know, can, can take notes and is, you know, it's generally a union steward and a, a steward's just generally um, a union member in your workplace who's been trained on uh, representational issues like uh, being in disciplinary meetings. Um, and uh, so 
if question is part of the investigation, um, a representative of, um, you know, of, of management where a representative of management, uh, may, um, require the employee to defend, explain, admit misconduct or work performance issues, um, that, and the employee again, believes that there may be, uh, some kind of discipline, um, or otherwise adverse consequence to their job status, they get to have a union representative with them. Um, and this is something that a lot of unions do education on, um, as employers are not required to tell employees of their right to representation. Um, but this is something that, uh, you know, is generally something unions, uh, do a lot of education on. And, um, it's really always helpful to have that, that, uh, you know, someone who is on your side in that meeting, um, again, to take notes, to catch things that you didn't catch, uh, to advise you whether, um, you know, to potentially, uh, not answer a question at that time, stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, uh, Bonnie or, or David, do you want to add anything to that? So I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, go over it a little bit. So I keep the card with me anytime I'm working. If I'm working from home, it's right here on my desk. If I go into work, I like to keep it in a safe place and everybody's got a cell phone. So I put it right in my case between the phone and the case. So I always have it with me. Um, you know, just the, it, it's nice having this on me because I've had, you know, one time where I thought maybe something was, you know, a little fishy. Um, turned out it wasn't, but, you know, I pulled it out right away and it just read it. It says, if this discussion in, in any way uh, lead to my being disciplined or terminated or affect my personal working conditions, I respectfully request that a union representative officer or steward be present at this meeting. Without union representation, I choose not to answer questions. So yeah, kind of what you were saying there is that, you know, at that point, you know, you you have the right to be protected. You have the right to have somebody to have your back. And I'll, I'll chime in there as well, because um, I was a union member many, many years myself, and then I became a union steward. So I was the one who was called in for those if I had coworkers who were called in for a discipline meeting or some concern by a supervisor. And oftentimes you can get caught off guard um, that that meeting is happening. And knowing that you don't have to go in alone, especially when your emotions are going to be running high, because immediately your brain is going to go into what did, what did I do or what did I not do? What do they think I did? Um, and your emotions are going to be running so quickly um, that it's good to have somebody in there as, um, like Katie and David said, as another set of eyes, another set of ears. Um, but also several times the questioning would get uh, very, uh, what do I want to say, accusatory. Um, and we also know, so stewards are trained. We do steward trainings a lot. Um, that the employer has to have evidence. So if there is no evidence, there are not going to be any answers to questions until they produce it. Thank you, Bonnie and David, for elaborating on that. Um, we've had a couple questions about um, uh, that people have supervisors at their company that are not empowered to hire a fire. Um, can they join the union? Bonnie, I'm going to defer to you on this one because sure. you're uh, probably have most experience about uh, what we call unit composition and, and figuring out who has the legal right to be in the union. Absolutely. And there are some companies that are intentionally throwing those kind of titles in people's names just intentionally to try to throw them off from um, being able to work collectively with their coworkers in order to make improvements and all everything up to and including forming a union. So that supervisory title does not automatically eliminate that person from being in a union. Um, what we do is we go through people's job descriptions. So when it comes to um, figuring out who would be in what's called the bargaining unit or who would be covered within the union, um, we wanna know if anybody has a management title or a supervisory title 
we want to take a look at what their job description says. Based off of what that job description says, we're able to answer if they are eligible or not. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, and then I think the, yeah, we have a lot of questions here. We have a couple of questions that kind of are inquiring about like timelines, like how long would it take, you know, and, and it, the short answer is it varies, but Bonnie, I might toss it over to you if you have uh, <laughs> any insight into elaborating on a, a question like that one. Absolutely. So uh, answering the question about what it takes from the beginning of the very first conversation um, to when you actually have an election and a final vote that is a win, um, it depends. Um, uh, as Alana said, it definitely varies. It varies on how quickly you're able to carve out what your um, regional um, delineation would be from other coworkers, whether that be like a certain office, a city, a region of the country, or it could even be a certain job classification. Um, from there, you need a list of who is all in there. And then you start building up what's called an organizing committee of people who are willing to start having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. This is not email communication. This is not texting communication. It is hard work. It takes a lot of stick with itness. Um, because you have to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations in order for people to feel heard and invested and feel like it's something that will matter to them. Once you get there, you want to build to your strong majority, going back to Katie's presentation. When you, you're you going to chart all this stuff out, you're going to collect the names and the responses and who's a strong yes union and who's like a maybe. Um, when you get to an absolute uh, majority, of your coworkers, you and yourself, we want about 65, 70% of them saying absolutely yes. That's when you um, start collecting those cards and people will sign those cards. And then you can, um, as Katie said, back to the presentation is where you can contact the NLRB and file for an election or contact your employer and have them recognize your union as it is. To, so the, I guess the short answer is it depends on how quickly people are willing to do all that work. And I would just add, I, you know, I haven't specifically worked to organize folks in insurance, but in other industries, and I'll, I'll just um, reiterate what Bonnie said, that it depends. I've seen, you know, workplaces, um, you know, in the hundreds take couple of years. So like, uh, you know, I think we had like 200 something folks take a couple of years. And then we had one uh, that I worked with that took like six months. Um, I've had small organizations that take, you know, I'm, I'm talking like 30 people that maybe take a month and a half. Um, I've had small organizations with the same amount that take, you know, a year and a half. So it, it does, uh, it does very widely. And then the other thing I would mention, I know for this, uh, one of the questions, there was a, a couple of questions about timelines um, that with the, it used to be that, you know, from the time you filed for NLRB election, the average was about three months until you got your election date. But uh, right now uh, with the NLRB and, and, and it's uh, funding, it can take longer. Um, and then as far as negotiating a contract, if you there's been a number of stories on this recently, I think uh, it was around 400 and something days. If you uh, look up, uh, there's a website on Bloomberg Law that has the actual number from from a study on that. Um, and there was a question for David about remote work and asking if you were able to negotiate remote uh, permanent remote work. Uh, David, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So that's actually funny that you bring that up because like I said, I am currently going through negotiations right now of a new contract. Uh, when I started with the company, we already had a contract in force and this went into force a month or two possibly before COVID kicked in and nothing was out there for remote work. Um, you know, if there was anything out there, it was very informal, very, you know, just kind of non-existent. So in my history, there's been 
a lot of changes as we, as we've gone through COVID, as we've come out of COVID times. You know, everyone's still kind of recovering. Um, there is that return to the office, you know, kind of worry. Um, I can say personally that, you know, it is something that is going to be brought up. Um, I know a lot of people have voiced their concerns with, you know, my own, uh, I guess, um, my own viewing from some of the meetings and, you know, listening to everybody else voice their concerns. Um, so we haven't gotten anything yet, but there's talks about, you know, possibly still having, you know, some kind of hybrid type thing. Um, I know I work in the city that our offices are in. They're expanding some of the offices. So yeah, there's a lot of worry. And I think that just something that a lot of people still have to consider, you know, going down the road through the future here. Thanks, David. And I know um, from uh, the OPEIU unit at True Stage, which uh, does insurance work, that they've secured remote work in their contract um, at this point. Um, so that's, you know, something, uh, that, that is definitely, uh, possible and on the minds of a lot of folks as, uh, there are changes, uh, when it comes, when it's coming to employers calling people back to their office for certain days. Um, okay. We have someone with their hand up. Oh, um. We have Richard Lanigan. Um, that's. Do you want, uh, yeah, let, just uh, unmute uh, uh, Richard, uh, if you, uh, Alana, do you want to do that? Yep. Richard, are you there? Maybe that was a mistake. He may have stepped away. Um, oh, okay. Do you want me to just quickly? Uh, Richard Lanigan is the uh, the international president of OPEIU, so we we do have kind of a guest appearance happening here. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if uh, Richard jumps we'll see in if he here. Circles back soon. I think he unmuted himself. Richard, are you there? Maybe not. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it for now. And uh, if if Richard comes on, we will have him talk. Um, we had a a question about who negotiates the contract, um, and um, I'll just go first. That you know, as the union, um, like uh, you're you know you're joining a, a larger national union, but as the union in your workplace you all generally negotiate the contract and you may um depending you know on on how you decide the structure of your union uh you might uh elect representatives to be physically at the table with management but i'll let um bonnie and david talk a little bit more about uh negotiation specifically at opeiu yeah and okay. i can kind of touch base on that um so Bonnie and I actually talked quite a bit when she was working with us at the OPEIU Local 9. Um, she was one of the main people I went to for advice and questions about everything. Um, with this process, yeah, we're the ones that have that voice. We're the ones that negotiate. You, the employees, have that voice. Now, what we do in some of the meetings is that we are all meeting as employees and then we have the union representative and then we also have our union stewards. The union stewards are the ones that collect all the voices and all the concerns and then they work with the union representative to go forward to the negotiations and that's where the back and forth communications come in. And then once there's that agreement, that's where we come back and you know we look at it and you know go from there. Right. And, um, exactly, David. And um, so unions that are just forming a union um, will begin to see people who are highly trusted, um, respected on the job, um, and people may nominate them to be on the bargaining committee to be one of the team. Um, literally, as David said, sitting across the table from the employer and bargaining proposals across the table. 
around wages, working conditions, remote work, any of those kinds of things. Um, you do have obviously the support though of OPIU organizers. You do have people who are highly trained legally um, for, uh, it becomes a legal document. So um, you have organizers and union rep representatives who know how to um, form this into the legalese that is necessary. And then we do also have OPIU attorneys um, to make sure that it is uh, it is absolutely 100% um, following the law on both sides. So um, all of that happens. And as David said, um, once those proposals are, they're called uh, tentative agreements, um, a lot of those things are shared with members. And then when it comes to voting, you literally get to vote yes or no. Do you think this contract is what you want? Do you not think it's what you want? And then the majority wins. Awesome. Um, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, so we have a question and just to um, reiterate, you have, uh, so, cause someone asked about what does a union contract usually consist of? Uh, so you have the, the legal right under the national labor relations act to negotiate over pay benefits and working conditions. Um, but those are what are called mandatory subjects of bargaining. So your employer has to collectively bargain with you on that, but there are also, uh, permissive uh, subjects of bargaining that go beyond that. Um, and uh, so that could be um, some, uh, now I'm, I'm blanking on my uh, permissive subjects of bargaining. I'll turn it, since Bonnie, uh, Bonnie's the organizer, I'll turn over to Bonnie to talk more about <laughs> what uh, has been um, negotiated in OPEIU uh, contracts. I, OPIU contracts can cover just about anything. Um, yeah, a lot of contracts do also follow what is already written in state and federal law, but they do want that in those contracts so that people do realize when you're reading your contract, oh yeah, so legally I'm protected this way and that way under the state and federal law. But permissive subjects of bargaining can be additional things such as, um, let's say that there's... Uh, some workroom space that you want available depending on whatever category of work you work in. So I used to be a high school teacher. So a permissive subject of bargaining would have been a teacher's lounge. <laughs> I know that's a really silly example, but um, that gave us space where, where um, our supervisors were not allowed to enter. Um, so at any time, um, employees could sit and discuss their working conditions and honestly begin to design some like collective action around any sort of thing that's happening. Um, so uh, I think people should know that um, issues related to harassment, um, sexual harassment and otherwise is already in contracts um, um, and that's not named in the mandatory subject to bargaining, but those are legal things that, that companies do have to follow. So we do put those in contracts as well. But um, basically when you have union meetings, when you bring your coworkers together, it's kind of like a wide open door of let's discuss everything. Let's put it all on the table. And then from there, um, a survey will come out and then they'll have discussions that the groups will come together and start writing some ideas on how to propose these things as solutions. So it could cover a whole lot of things. Yeah. Now I remember I was going to say uh, parking, parking spaces closer to the, the building. Yeah, my brother's union uh, negotiated for that. And I, I, I believe that's permissive. I love um, that random example. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important um, one. <laughs> if I can chime in on that real quick too, because so like I said, um, we're in our negotiations right now, and um, for anybody that may be familiar with Northwestern Mutual in Milwaukee, they're expanding their office in the downtown campus. They're moving the suburban office to downtown and kind of compacting everybody there in one big one big campus. A lot of people have concerns about that. Um, whether it's commuting, whether it's, you know, public transportation, COVID changed public transportation here in my city. I don't know how it is everywhere else, but, you know, a lot of the highway flyers got, you know, closed down and they haven't come back. So these are all things that we're bringing to, you know, the hierarchy as far as like, what are, what what's Northwestern Mutual doing? What is our company doing for us? And, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, personally, for me, I have a Kia Forte. And that is a highly, um, 
you know, highly stolen vehicle <laughs> at this time. So parking in a downtown open parking area, I have concerns on that. So that's something that I bring in. I know it seems so little, but these are things that people have to remember. It's these little things and that job security and just overall security in general that we have to keep in mind. Nothing is too small. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, so two things I see in some of the questions are, um, I guess, uh, talking about how to determine um, the unit size, if it's the whole company, if it's an office, um, like where you live. Um, that's been a question. Also, somebody has asked about a right to work state. And I just want to make it completely clear because um, I, I know it confuses uh, folks and, and quite frankly, the wording is confusing. But since you're when you're in a right to work state, you can still form a union. It just uh, means that those under a union contract, if you choose not to be a member, you do not have to pay um, the contract administration fee. Um, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty of that. But uh, I just want to repeat that even if you work in a right to work state, you can still form and have a union. Um, so th there's a, I, I was going to turn it over to Bonnie to talk about both like uh, determining uh, like how to define your union. And then also um, we have a couple questions about how to deal with uh, retaliation um, or, or union busting at, at, the, at a company. And I also want to just remind everyone, we have about four minutes left in our program, and these questions have been great. Um, while Bonnie is answering these amazing questions, I'm going to type in the chat um, our email address so that you can email us with questions and so we can put you in touch with an organizer. Sorry to interrupt, Bonnie. No, that's perfect. Um, I didn't realize we were running so close. So um, how do you define your bargaining unit? Um, uh, so that a bargaining unit is the term that we use for anybody who would be in the union. So again, not anybody who can hire and fire, not anybody who um, is like a CEO or anything along those lines. Um, again, we would take a look at the job description if there's some questions about some people. But how do you even begin to look at it? So we're taking a look at some huge insurance companies. Like we have Progressive, we have State Farm, we have Geico, right? These are national. And even there's there's some that even have some offices overseas in Europe and in um, South America and such. So um, we know that companies intentionally will keep changing their regions um, in order to keep y'all from being able to unionize. Because otherwise, if they keep the region, we can say, let's go with region one, right? We see a lot of action in region one and that could be like, you know, just like the West coast or it could be just like the the um, uh, the East coast. I mean, honestly, it could be like anything like that. Um, but what do we do when companies keep changing that? Then we might wanna take a look at classifications, right? So a lot of call centers. So we know that's where people are popping off. Like that is where the, the it's just been really bad in call centers, a lot of turnover, a lot of low pay, a lot of expectations without a lot of clarity, um, supervisors changing all the time. So you either need to build it off of maybe like a central office, like y'all are paid out of Houston, Texas. Doesn't matter where you live, but if you are somebody who your home office is Houston, Texas, we can organize you. So that's where we can start building the base off of, right? Or if let's say a lot of the classifications um, are not that hot about unionizing except for one or two classifications, then let's go that route. And we will just get the list. Then you have to get the list of the people who are in that classification or have that home office as their, as their job center, um, even if they work remotely 100% of the time, but wherever they're getting their paycheck from, that's how we can figure out if that's going to be the area that we begin to organize and have those conversations. Like Katie said, way at the beginning, you have to have those one-on conversations to start with. Um, question number two, I forgot what it was already. That was that is about retaliation. So retaliation. can we, yeah, talk about, first off, it's, it's a, as I, I mentioned, it's illegal uh, to retaliate against you for organizing a union. 
Um, but uh, I'll, I'll turn over the Bonnie to talk about some strategies uh, to prevent employers from trying. So employers are going to hear really quickly as soon as conversations begin to hit kind of the ripple waves and um, reach out into other departments of a, of a workplace, management's going to hear, right? So we always know that. Um, the best ways to make sure that we are fighting back against any retaliation is number one, know what your legal rights are. Legally, even if you are like in the way beginnings of forming a union, the federal law protects you from um, from any retaliation or discipline or termination um, as long as it is uh, connected to a collective action with your coworkers. So the good thing is we've got the law there. The bad thing is we have sneaky um, companies with really expensive lawyers who will tell you to tell their managers how to make up a disciplinary issue, right? So um, know that those things can happen um, and we do have the organizers there, but the great thing to do is first build up your organizing committee and then tell everybody what should we expect. What do we think managers are gonna do when they hear that we're starting to form a union? When we know that they're gonna start saying they don't have money or they're gonna start downsizing or they're gonna start laying people off, right? When people are ready for that, they begin to kind of glue themselves together more to the hub of who's going to take action instead of running away. Um, companies want to rely on people just leaving if they're not happy, right? But that's not what we do. We're warriors. We're going to stick together and we're going to make the changes that need to happen. So retaliation, the best thing you can do is do not keep it to yourself. Um, so, um, if you know that you are being retaliated, once you started working to form a union or talk about a collective action, make sure you document all the W's, the who was around, who did it, where was it, what was said or done, and, um, make sure that you connect with your organizer or your organizing team. Um, cause you, we can file through the NLRB, um, that that would be an unfair labor practice. And we already know that some of these things happened in Buffalo with Geico. Uh, yeah. And, but, you know, the unfair labor practice, uh, you know, will go to the NLRB and there's a number of remedies that uh, they will work, um, you know, they will work with the union and the, you know, the retaliated employee on. Um I know we are over time. I did see that uh, President Richard Landigan of OPEIU put uh, some, uh, something in the chat. He wanted to let us know that uh, the OPEIU local in New York um, has two insurance uh, bargaining units, or, or so they have um, a presence at two insurance companies um, and that have negotiated for permanent virtual work in their uh, union contract or uh, otherwise known as the collective bargaining agreement. I think everyone who, an who asked questions uh, I know we didn't get to them all. If you uh, send us an email at organize at dpeaflcio.org, uh, we will uh, answer your questions. Um, we'll also send out the link to this recording and a, uh, a post-event survey uh, in a follow-up email to everyone who attended. Um, I thank you so much. And I thank David, Bonnie, and Alana as well. Um, and I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you all.